It's 2025 and AHA has finally released their updates. Let's go over the updates that apply to you as an EMT. Do you feel like you're learning a lot from the videos on our channel? Most of the videos are part of our online EMT course through Idaho Medical Academy. With the flexibility of an online course, you can take it anywhere, then join us in one of our skills locations to learn the hands-on skills. We also have an online AEMT course for EMTs who want to expand their skills and knowledge. We are currently offering a discount for our subscribers who want to take an EMT course or AEMT course. Reach out to us at info at idahoacademy.com for more details. For more information on what courses we offer and the course details, please visit idahomedicalacademy.com. All right, so looking at the new updates for 2025, there are uh, a lot of updates overall. We are only going to talk about the BLS updates. So if you're an advanced EMT, paramedic, uh, a higher level nurse, something like that that needs to carry PALS, ACLS, or maybe a different AHA certification, there are going to be different updates uh, for those courses. We're not gonna talk about those here. We're just gonna go over the basic updates for the BLS certification that you're probably holding if you're watching this channel uh, or you're gonna have to hold because you're trying to be an EMT. So um, it's, it's not a lot, it's pretty basic stuff, but it's still good for you to be aware of it. Uh, the rollout for this is not going to be immediate, so you might go take a CPR class in a couple months and still have the 2020 material that will be a little bit different than this. So just be aware of that. Make sure if you're going to do a CPR class, follow whatever the book uh, and the material that you're watching says when you're taking your test. But this is where everything is going in the near future. So uh, it's, it's good for you to be aware of it. So the first change, to me this is kind of the smallest one, uh, is that AHA now has a unified chain of survival. So uh, there is going to be a single chain that applies to both adult and pediatric cardiac arrest, and that will be in hospital and out of hospital. If you're like me going through a, BHA or a BLS class, I just kind of skip over the, the um, chain of survival. Um, it's just an AHA thing that I'm not too concerned about myself. Um, but if you, if you do pay attention to that, there typically has been a different one for in hospital versus out of hospital. Now it's just one single chain of survival. It doesn't change um, de depending on in or out of hospital. So now the links are going to be recognition and emergency activation, high quality CPR, defibrillation, advanced resuscitation, post cardiac arrest care, recovery and survivorship. So if you're an EMT or somebody that works in the field, this all makes perfect sense to you. It's what we do anyways. Now we just have that unification of what we're talking about and the language uh, is gonna be the same for in and out of hospital. One of the bigger, I don't wanna call it a change cause it's not really a change, but one of the things that um, the AHA is really stressing for 2025 is going to be uh, really um, stressing being good with our ventilations. So hands only CPR became a thing fairly recently that we teach to lay people. Um, and so we've been kind of discounting ventilations, I feel like a little bit when we're teaching these courses. And AHA is course correcting that a little bit to really start to focus a little more again on ventilation. So um, they want us to provide enough tidal volume for visible chest rise, which is what we should be doing anyways. But I think it's just kind of uh, fell to a lower priority in when we're teaching it. And so that is really a big push from the AHA in 2025. Uh, so avoiding hypoventilation with too few breaths or too, uh, too little volume, and then hyperventilation, too many breaths or too much volume. So this is stuff we should be doing already if we are competent uh, as an EMS provider. But again, they're really, really pushing that. Uh, so just be aware that this is gonna be something that maybe when you're testing your skills, they're gonna be looking a little more closely for. So. Um, that's a, that's a big, uh, big push, but not really a big change uh, for this year. Uh, the reason really being that recent study, studies have shown rescuers often fail to deliver ventilation in accordance with guidelines. So um, they've just seen that we are not doing this very well, and so they're pushing for it. So like I said, be ready for that. Um, shouldn't be a big change, but really think about that when you're doing your CPR class, of uh, being comfortable and competent with doing those good quality ventilations. Uh, another thing that, again, maybe not so much of a change, but pushing the recommendations again, is going to be the 30 to 2 compression to ventilation ratio until we have the placement of that advanced airway um, and kind of 
advising against continuous compressions. And that 32 is going to be for an adult. Um, but uh, really the, the thing is to um, reiterate the, um, the 30 to 2 over uh, continuous compressions. There are a lot of places uh, that have moved away from 30 to 2. I know locally here uh, in the Treasure Valley, that's what we do for CPR. We do continuous, uh, continuous ventilations. Um, and so, like I said, they're pushing that 30 to 2. Uh, the majority of studies um, that they have found report no difference in patient outcomes between that interrupted CPR with ventilation pauses and continuous compressions. Um, however, recent evidence uh, has shown that ventilation is often not adequate, and this is back to what we said before, that ventilation is a big push. Uh, so the use of CPR um, with cycles of 30 compressions followed by two ventilations as opposed to that continuous chest compressions allows rescuers to monitor for chest rise and therefore to check for adequate ventilation. So if we are pausing, we can look at that chest rise versus that continuous CPR. There's no way for us to really see how effective our ventilations are being. So that's where the push is, and there's not really any science showing that continuous compressions have better outcomes, so there's not really any reason to do it, is what the AHA is saying. This might be controversial for your department, or for your practice. Again, this is just what AHA is saying based off of the science that they have. So uh, make sure you're aware of that, but at the end of the day, if you're a professional responder, you just need to follow your protocols. So do whatever your protocols state, um, but this is going to be what you are expected to do in a BLS class is going to be that 30 to 2. Uh, so DFib pads, they're, they're talking a little bit about, um, again, not so much any changes, maybe a little bit of a change for uh, the placement, but more or less things are going to be the same. Um, if you're teaching CPR, one thing that they are uh, pushing towards the public is to have people adjust a bra as opposed to remove a bra with a uh, female patient who goes into cardiac arrest and needs to have those DFib uh, pads placed. So uh, there's just not a lot of compliance, uh, not as much compliance with female patients versus male patients as far as uh, placement of defib pads. Just because I think, especially lay people, they don't feel comfortable uh, stripping a woman um, of her bra and making her kind of open to the world to see her topless, right? And so we, uh, we're not concerned about that really as, as uh, EMS responders. We understand that we have a job to do and the embarrassment of somebody uh, being exposed is, a, is better than them dying, right? So it's not something that I think we need to be concerned about as professional responders. This is more a public access thing, right? So if you're teaching CPR courses, if you are talking to anybody in the public, somebody comes into your fire station, something like that and talks about CPR, that's what they're going to be pushing. Just move the bra out of place and keep the, uh, the patient covered up versus just cutting that bra and removing it. So not a real big change, just a little bit of a change of uh, what we're pushing for the public. Uh, uh, the pad placement, we are still continuing to place the pads in the same spot. The big thing that they're pushing is the upper right pad to be vertical and the lower left pad to be horizontal. So they want one pad placed vertically on the person's right upper chest with the top of that pad uh, just under the clavicle or collarbone and then the second pad horizontally on the left lateral ribs. Uh, the middle of the pad should be about the axilla or the armpit area at the mid axillary line. So we're not gonna go up and up, we're gonna go up and sideways, which again, maybe not a change, maybe that's what your practice has been uh, all the time. I know for our uh, AD trainers, that is what the pads already show on the pictures is to have it horizontal uh, for that mid axillary pad, um, but they're gonna be pushing for that for the pad placement. So. Just make sure you get that into your practice. Uh, it's a pretty simple thing to do. Um, another thing that they are talking about is naloxone administration during cardiac arrest. Um, and they are saying that that is reasonable if it does not delay high quality CPR. And this is another thing that uh, maybe is a protocol dependent thing, um, that there is a thought that, you know, if somebody is overdosed on an opiate, if we are ventilating that patient, then we are managing that overdose to begin with, we don't really need to push naloxone, uh, but this is what HA is saying that as long as you're not, you know, stopping chest compressions to push that naloxone, if you have the hands to do it, it's reasonable to do it and there's no reason really not to. So again, this might change your practice, it might not, and this is again probably going to be a protocol dependent thing for people that work professionally in the EMS and fire service. 
Uh, foreign body airway obstruction, there is a bit of a change for that. So um, adults and children, they now want uh, to alternate five back blows with five abdominal thrusts until the object is expelled or patient becomes unresponsive. So traditionally, when it comes to FBAO, um, our treatment for adults was just the Heimlich maneuver. We're just gonna do those abdominal thrusts. And now we're gonna go back to what your mom did when you were a kid and you know, choked on some food. Uh, and we're gonna do the five back blows alternating with those abdominal thrusts. Um, for infants, uh, we are gonna be doing five back blows with five chest thrusts, uh, similar to what we've done historically for them. So no real change for infants. It's gonna be adding those back blows to adults. Uh, and they find that people coughing is kind of the best thing that will help get uh, an airway obstruction out and kind of giving those back blows helps with that. Um, and we don't wanna do the, uh, the abdominal thrust for infants just cause there's a high risk of causing injury uh, to those infants. So adults and children, five and five back blows, abdominal thrusts, infants, five and five back blows and chest thrusts like we've done historically. So a big change there is just those back blows for adults and children. Um, they're again pushing high quality CPR with no pauses in compressions that are greater than 10 seconds. Um, I don't know why this was listed as, um, as a change going through the AHA uh, paperwork that I, that I saw, um, but they're just pushing again infants and children to minimize those interruptions. It might be something that they've seen in studies that people are not doing it very well. Um, but just in general, those, those pauses and chest compressions should be quick. Uh, absolutely should be less than 10 seconds. Um, it may be a little hard sometimes with your AED doing its thing, but we wanna shoot for less than 10 seconds and they're pushing that again. Uh, one of the bigger changes uh, that we're seeing is we are changing how we are doing infant compressions. So uh, the two finger technique, um, you probably learned the two finger technique for infants is no longer recommended. Uh, now they are pushing for the heel of the hand or the two thumb encircling technique. So heel of the hand is typically what was taught for children and then two fingers for infants. They are completely removing the two finger technique teaching and we're going just to heel of hand or that round two, uh, two thumb technique. Uh, systematic reviews and meta analysis from simulation studies uh, have suggested that the two thumb encircling hands technique is the superior technique for giving compressions to infants when compared with a two finger technique, particularly for achieving that adequate depth. And so depth is a very important thing, um, and so that's something that they're really pushing for. Uh, they're also changing a little bit of the terminology for uh, the depth of compressions with infants uh, and starting to talk about one third to a half of the chest versus two inches or three inches or anything like that. So uh, you might see that change. Um, that's how I've always thought about it because that kind of is a, uh, a way to fit all patients, just a third to a half of the chest. So you, you'll see that change as well, that they're moving away from giving specific measurements to um, a measurement based off the patient size. Uh, and the real, real controversial one um, that I've already heard some people uh, rabble rousing about a little bit is the, um, the HA now states the routine use of mechanical CPR versus, sorry, uh, CPR devices is not recommended for adult cardiac arrest. So that means they are not uh, recommending the use of the Lucas device, the autopulse, those kind of things uh, in routine use. So um, HA states that in adult cardiac arrest, the use of mechanical CPR devices may be considered in specific settings where the delivery of high quality manual compressions may be challenging or dangerous for the healthcare professionals, as long as they strictly limit interruptions in CPR during deployment and removal of the device. Uh, numerous trials have demonstrated no difference in patient survival between manual CPR and mechanical CPR. There may be specific circumstances, however, in which the use of mechanical CPR devices may provide logistical or safety advantages. These situations are not represented in current clinical trials. So I have heard lots of people that work in the field, uh, maybe getting upset's not the right, maybe that's a little strong, uh, but that don't like this recommendation. And I think the AHA is essentially saying like, if all things are the same, mechanical CPR is not recommended, but when you're moving patients down the stairs, when they're in a tight bathroom that it's hard to get responders in, all those kind of things, they're saying that there's, there are cases where mechanical CPR makes sense and may be more effective, uh, but if all things are the same, like we said, and you're just in the middle of the living room doing CPR, uh, it's probably better to do manual CPR. Um, I'm, 
sure that there's a lot of reasons for that. I didn't see any listed specifically when I was going through it, but just from my experience watching the Lucas device be used a, a many number of times, sometimes we really suck at putting it on and there's very long pauses of getting it, getting it in place. Even if we practice it, it can really, um, we can withhold chest compressions, which is the most important thing for longer amounts of time than we should. I'd imagine that's a driving force of why uh, they're changing this recommendation, especially when there's no science showing mechanical CPR has better outcomes. So um, again, this is gonna be kind of based off your local protocols, so follow what your protocols state, uh, but the AHA is now no longer recommending the use of those mechanical CPR devices. So those are the major changes. Like I said, this is not fully encompassing of all the changes. So when you go take a CPR class, make sure you're paying attention. There's some other things that can come through. There are some other things in the ACLS and PALS site as well that we didn't cover here. So if you need to have those certifications, again, make sure you're really paying attention to those updates uh, on that end of things as well. Uh, if you're watching this, you want to become an EMT, advanced EMT, check out idahomedicalacademy.com. We have our self-paced courses. Uh, you can do from anywhere uh, and come to one of our skills locations to get those skills knocked out. And we have a self-paced advanced course as well uh, if you want to go become an advanced EMT. If you need to get your CPR done, you're in the Boise area. We offer CPR, ACLS, PALS, PHTLS. We have all those number courses, sorry, all those letter courses. So if you need those, check out the website as well. Hit subscribe, hit like, all that stuff. Thanks for being here. We'll see you guys next time.